So let's have a look at how does JPEG work. So, the things I'm going to tell you now will not surprise you. And the reason they will not surprise you is because we've already discussed at length today and in the last lecture. First of all, what is the baseline of JPEG? Well, we will apply transform. We we'll divide the image into blocks, size of the blocks 8 by 8, so slightly bigger than I, than I showed here, 8 by 8, and we are going to apply discrete cosine transform to each and every block. That's how we're going to work. So you remember the baboon slide. First we apply transform, we get some transform coefficients, then we apply quantization, So, here we'll have quantization, but it's psychovisually weighted. Quantization. Would anybody risk a guess what psychovisually weighted quantization might be? Is it related to how our vision works? Okay, very good. And how is this related? what details we need and what details actually don't perceive. So if you think about anything you do in life when you want to take something from somebody. I'm not encouraging you to do that, but if you ask a thief what is the best way to steal a wallet from somebody, he will say, well, you've got to do it so he does not notice, right? at least initially. It's the same principle here. We want to apply this quantization so that the user, and who is the user? Are they baboons? No, they are people, right? Mostly people, that people don't notice a difference, okay? Then if they don't notice, they are not going to complain. Right? So that's why we are going to apply the quantization in the way so that people do not notice or it's not very upsetting to them, okay? That's why it has to be directed to our eyes. Very good. Now, we are also going to do other tricks. We are going to apply differential coding to some coefficients, transform coefficients. Why are we applying differential coding? What is differential coding? Does it have any relation between or to prediction? Differential coding is you code the difference between the previous one and the next one. So how does it relate to prediction? So what it really means is that when you code the difference, means you in fact predict the next one from the previous one. It's the same one. When you say, all right, I'm going to encode the error, which is the difference. Okay? So it's a form of prediction. So differential coding followed by Hoffman coding. Does it surprise you? Yeah, probably yes. So <laughs> ask someone else. <laughs> no, but seriously, does it surprise you? Did we, did we apply Hoffman coding after the differential coding? Does it surprise you? Be honest, if it surprises you, that's fine. We'll explain why it shouldn't. Does it surprise you? Okay, but you remember, when did we, differential coding is a kind of a prediction, right? When we applied prediction here, what did we say about the distribution of the values when we had a big prediction? It's spiky. We change the flat distribution to spiky. Is spiky distribution good or bad? You remember entropy? Entropy for spiky distribution was very low, so the less information to process is very good. Spiky distributions are good. Flat distributions is a random distribution. It's, there is nothing to compress. Perfectly flat distribution means complete random. When there is a complete randomness, nothing is predictable. That's the definition of the randomness. When something is completely spiky, there is no randomness. It's just you know what's coming, right? So, that's why we apply Hoffman coding. Is Hoffman coding the best coding we could apply here? Or is there something better? Um, please, Hoffman coding. Mathematic coding. 
Arithmetic coding would be better. Very good. Why didn't we apply arithmetic coding? I should not ask you this question because there is no scientific or good reason. The reason arithmetic coding was not applied is because I think maybe it was before it was invented. <laughs> and if it was invented, then there was a patent from IBM. So it's very really difficult to put in a standard something that's been patented. Okay? So we know we can do better, but there is a hope. Excellent. Now, zigzag scan. I'll explain what zigzag scan is, but basically we need to somehow scan the image or scan the coefficients because image is two dimensional and we are sending something through a telephone line or an internet line. It's serial, right? We have to somehow send one by one, so we have to do some scan. Very good. So we will cover the baseline algorithm and we'll look at extended algorithms really to kind of wind up your brain, excite you about what might be happening when you, when you decide you want to be an image and video coding expert or specialist. Okay, we'll look at various things that can be done here. So we'll look at uh, extended algorithms, including progressive, hierarchical, and this is not just to wind up your brain. This is a very simple and very base algorithm, lossless JPEG coding algorithm, not really used very often. Very useful for me and very useful for you. Now you may say, why is that algorithm so useful if it's not very useful in practice? Well, it's very useful because it's not very complicated. It shows all the principles of image coding. So when I write my exam questions, it's a perfect thing to ask you because I don't want you to learn things by heart. I want you to understand. And for this algorithm, all you have to do is to understand, okay? So it's very useful for me because I can write exam questions here without feeling that I'm unfair on you, that I'm asking you to learn something by heart. And it's very useful for you because Exam. Because you want to answer the exam question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Some of you. So anyway, so this is a very useful al algorithm. But, you know, it does really tell you, it does exercise all the principles, okay? Right. So. So there are some formulas, okay? I'm not going to... Uh, uh, I don't want you to necessarily learn this formula by heart. If if there is, if you have to apply this formula or another, I'll put it on a on a uh, on the exam question. But the whole point here is, I want you to kind of feel what this formula is. So what it does, what it does, there are two summations from zero to seven. So it basically goes along the block. It goes rows by rows or, or columns by columns. So zero from seven, so it's eight, eight. So it sums up, it goes within this block, so it's eight by eight, and goes bang, 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 one by one. And what it does, it multiplies, it multiplies the value f of x and y, is the value of pixel here. Each of these pixels is multiplied by a cosine functions. Why cosine function? Does it surprise you? No, it's a discrete cosine transform. So the bases are defined by the cosine transforms. These are the basis functions. Do you remember? I've shown you here that when we design these bases, it could be a sine of different frequency along this axis and along this axis that are combined. So this is really the the mathematical way of calculating the values of this basis function. From cosine functions, because this transform is defined by the cosine function. And I'm going to jump a couple of slides and I'm going to show you the basis functions. Okay. So what do you see? You see exactly what I told you. This one, this row, shows you the cosine function, but only in the x direction. In the y direction, it's just flat. It's a zero frequency, okay? If you go into, into this column, you can see the cosine function, but going in that direction. And anything here is a combination of different cosine functions of different frequencies, 
in X and Y. So please notice, the frequency, as we go here, the frequency is, as we go here, is the frequency increasing or decreasing? Mm -hmm. Increasing. And as we go here, is the frequency increasing or decreasing? This is low frequency or high frequency? This is low or high? What is this? High. So as we go here, the frequency is increasing. Exactly. Okay? So these are the basic structures. And now, depending where we are here, is higher frequency in x direction of higher frequency in one direction. And when we come here, is the highest frequency in x and y dimension. It looks like a chess board. So these are the basis functions. So every image, block in the image, is going to be represented by a weighted sum, weighted sum of these functions. So when you perform this formula, when you calculate this formula, here, you get, this is how you calculate this coefficient. So you calculate u and v is the frequency, is which coefficient is it, and it impacts here the frequency of each of these cosines. So if you say you want the coefficient 0, 0. 0, 0 is the low, lowest frequency. There are no cosines at all. What you will see, this one is a cosine. This is 0, and this is 0. So everything here under cosine is 0. A cosine of 0 is 1. So this is 1, this is 1. And all we have is a sum of all the pixels in the block, because this is always one and this is always one. So we have just the sum of pixels, the, the average, that's why it's called a DC component. It's a constant component. There is no sines or cosines. Okay? And if you look at this, is this one. The basis function is just constant. There's no variation. But as you change u and v, your basis function will become more high frequency. Okay, it will contain higher frequencies in the x and y direction. So when you do, when you do that, when you apply this formula I've shown you, you have to apply it 64 times to calculate <coughs> f00, f01, and f01 will have one of these cosine frequencies here, f12, until you get which f 7 <clears throat> Okay, and um, here we have an example of how we could have one dimensional VCT in a matrix form, but don't worry about it. We have here two two dimensional VCT, and um, this is one. So you can do it for 1D, of course. You can do the same transformation in one dimensional case, but then you cannot apply it to the, to the block in the image. But if you have one dimensional signal, maybe signal coming from microphone, you could apply coding, you could apply one dimensional DCT, where you would have, if you have in one dimension seven point DCT or eight point DCT, you would have eight values coefficients and you could calculate it as this kind of matrix times the values of your signal. And this is how it works. But that's, these are our basis functions. How many basis functions do we have? How many basis functions? Don't, you can say, even if it's wrong, that's wrong. How many basis functions? We have one basis function here. This is the basis block. Two, three, how many? We have eight in that direction, right? From zero to seven, and eight direction in this. So how many? 64. We have 64 basis functions. So we start with a block, eight by eight. 
So we had 64 pixels, right? 64 values to code. Now we perform the transformation. We have 64 basis functions, and for each of these basis function, we'll have one coefficient. So we ended up having 64 coefficients. So we replace 64 pixel values with 64 coefficients. And I'll just interrupt for a few seconds this, and I'll try to switch to. Okay, um, the other one, just to show you the baboon again. I want you to have your slides open on the baboon. Okay. So we, we've taken a block from an image eight by eight. And now we went through this transform and we have 64 coefficients. Each of these coefficients relates to one of the basis functions. Okay, please keep this slide open. I'll, I'll refer to it again. Great. Okay. So for each of this function, we'll have one number, a coefficient. How much of that ingredient I need to add? So you can imagine that this coefficient will be arranged on a two-dimensional grid like that. This coefficient will be so-called DC coefficient, because there is no frequency here. You remember from your electrical engineering course, when you have AC, sorry, DC, DC basically means no frequencies, right? It's just a constant value. This represents the constant value, this represents the average value, and all these coefficients here represent how much of each of this frequency you need to add to reconstruct the original one. Very good. Now, why people spend a lot of time saying why DCT is, for example, better than discrete Fourier transform? But one of the reasons why it's better is because when you think about the periodicity of the DFT is kind of non-continuous and DCT has got very nice continuity which means that the blocks just fit a bit better together. The coefficients behave a bit better. So people found out that DCT is in fact much better. Now, We are now talking about making really good compression. So what we know, we know that we have this matrix of the coefficients. We have eight coefficients by eight coefficients. We know that this is a DC coefficient. What we also know that this represents, in this corner here, represents lower frequencies. And this represents higher frequencies. You remember this? This look like a chess pattern, really high frequency. Now what we know from the human visual system, that our visual system is not so sensitive to high frequencies. We are more sensitive to low frequencies. So, given that we are not so sensitive here, but we are more sensitive here, what do you think will happen with quantization? Where are we going to really aggressively quantize to very few values? Meaning, when we quantize to very few value means really we introduce an error in that quantization. We introduce an error in this way. Where are we going to really coarsely quantize? Where are we going to save bits? Who would like to venture the answer? In the lower frequencies. In the lower frequencies, but we see we are more sensitive to lower frequencies. So if we quantize a lot, meaning we introduce a lot of errors, we will see it more, mm. right? So we need to really go to where we don't see. We don't see here. In extreme case, we can even set some of these coefficients to zero, 
which means that the image will have less high frequencies. Okay? So it'll be kind of blurred, a bit blurred. Not ideal, but if we don't have bits, that's what we need to do. So think about it as we move from here to here. This is less quantization. This is more quantization. So now <coughs> somebody thought, all right, so if we go from here to here, <coughs> how do we how do we scan? If we do scanning like this, this is not very good because then we go to high frequency here without tackling these low frequencies here. So somebody thought of zigzag scanning. Let's scan like this. in order to first have these low frequencies in all directions and then move to the high frequencies. Very good, okay. So, this is what we are going to do. VC coefficient, this represents the original value, the average value in a block. This is going to be coded differentially why code it differentially, you know. This is the old trick. When we code differentially, it means we predict the next value from the previous value, right? Code it differentially means we say, we expect that this block will have the same average value here than this block. Is it a reasonable assumption for eight by eight blocks? Yeah, not unreasonable. Neighboring blocks in the image probably have similar grade level. Value. Is it always going to be good position? No, sometimes it will not be a good prediction, but on average, it will be probably a good prediction means that this distribution will be peaky because the prediction error will be zero close to zero. Occasionally, something, there may be a big error. If we take this block, well, this, is, this actually would not be bad, but um, if we take something dark, if we went from this block to this block here, the average value would be very different. So you hear some of the detail of this distribution, but on, on average, it's very picky, so it's very good. So DC components is differentially coded. And how about AC components, or so all the other components? Um, I'll skip that for the moment. Right. When it comes to AC components, we will have a quantization step that will change from not so big to really big. What is the quantization step? That means how many values we are going to group into one value. So here, every 16, here our coefficient has to jump by 16 in order to be assigned to the next value. So quantization step is 16. But here quantization step is 120. Here is 99. So really a lot of DC coefficient values will be grouped into a single representation. That means quantization error Quantization error on average is about half of the quantization steps. So quantization error here is about 50. And quantization error here on average will be about eight. So you can see how big it is. How did this table uh, uh, was generated? This is sweat of many, many people, PhD students, undergraduate students, professors, where they basically did psychovisual tests. They were playing. They were changing the values in each of them individually until somebody noticed the difference, okay? So somebody was shown to me, do you see any difference? No. Okay, now we're going to make it 69. Do you see any difference? I think I can see a difference. <laughs> he better said he saw the difference, otherwise he would have to stay another night looking at images. No. But it's a kind of a torturous process, but, you know, psychovisual experiments. People in front of monitors and somebody playing with this and saying how much we can change this before somebody sees the difference. That's, that's why they arrived to these values like 100, 103, 99. A lot of, a lot of experimental work. This is the quantization table. 
Okay? So what you can see here, the quantization steps are very large. Here, quantization steps are pretty small. Excellent. So uh, we know how we quantize, and uh, we know that we are going to, for DC predictions, for DC coefficients, we will have a prediction. One block delay means that this value for the previous block is subtracted from a DC coefficient, which means that uh, this value of DC coefficient is assumed to be similar in neighboring blocks. And there is another trick that is applied, which is a kind of nice trick. And it relates to the fact that distribution of these um, coefficients after quantization is kind of, they are much more probable, um, well, differential on zero, it's, it's something like that. So they thought, right, we could code sign separately, so either it's plus or minus, because it's symmetrical. So now we've taken this one, mapped it here, because we don't care. We just use this one, and we say it's negative, it's on this side. And then we know that there are a lot of more cases of small values than large ones. So a good way to code it is to say, first talk about size, and then about amplitude. What does it really mean? It means, first you say, where are you on this axis? This is the size. So for example, 0 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 32. So first I'll say where I am. So this will be size 1. You know, this will be uh, small, and this will be uh, medium, and this will be x, and this will be 2x, and so forth. Think about it like that. Like the size of garments. It will be a number for that. And then you say, right, so for small, I can have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So then I have to, for, for that, I have to say where within a small region I am. Because I still have few values for small, because that's a range. So I'm going to have size and amplitude. Size is which of these intervals is here. I'll show you the detailed values later on. And amplitude is now, when I say I'm between 0 and 4, where, what is the value exactly? Is it 0, is it 1, is it 2, or is it 3? OK? So that's a kind of coding, it's a kind of clever way of coding things which are very frequently happening here, and not so frequently happening here, because when you do that, the small size will happen very frequently. You, it's very good for uh, spiky arithmetic coding. And then you can say where within that size you are. So it's size and amplitude. It's a pair of symbols. So this is what they worked out with. OK, so size 1 covers the possible values of minus 1 or 1. 0 is a special symbol. They reserved zero as a special symbol. We'll talk about in the moment how we treat zero. Zero is a special symbol. Zero comes up very often. Is it good or bad that zero comes up very often? Right. right. And you think about is it uh, if something comes very often, the distribution is flat or spiky? Spiky. Spiky. This is very frequently. And spiky distributions are good or bad? Good because low entropy, because entropy for spiky stuff is good. So the fact that zero is coming frequency is great. The fact it was designed like this. Okay, so zero comes frequently. We'll, we'll, I'll tell you how to do with zero. But if it's not zero, we can extra small, size very small. Size one, two values, minus one and one. Size two, values minus three, minus two, two, three. Size three, if you have more values here, and so on. Please notice that the size of different sizes, size of sizes, what I mean by that is that 
the size one contains two values, the size two contains four values, the size three contains eight values, right? Yes. So the size of the size, we can say that, is doubling. Why is that? Well, look what is happening with this distribution goes down. So when I double the size, this goes into eight here, and the next one goes to you know, 32 here. The area within the size is probably reasonably similar because there are, it's less, there's less values, but, but by size increases. So which means that, you know, this size is the kind of, they are more flat, the distribution, the probability of getting, we are still most likely to get size one, but you know, even this size is here, I can't kind of, doesn't go to very low probabilities. It's a nice trick too. But anyway, size and range coding. This is the principle. We first, we say how far we are and then what is the principle. So now size um, is coded using variable length coding. Variable length coding, you should always think it's either Hoffman coding or arithmetic coding. But you, you remember that I told you that in JPEG we are using because could somebody check when arithmetic coding was developed? How does it compare to the JPEG standard? Because obviously maybe the arithmetic coding did not exist then. Good. And so size is coded using VLC and the amplitude is uh, coded in sine magnitude format. So that's what I told you, whether it's positive or negative. And um, the number of bits to code the amplitude depends on the size. Obviously it's thus, because if you look at that table, if I have size one, how many bits do I need to code the range? Uh, yeah. For size one, how many bits do I need to code this? Two. Two. No, one bit. Oh. There oh, are two one. values, so okay. one bit, right? How many bits I need to code size two? Yeah, two bits, because we have four values. How many values we need to code, who looks very sleepy? Nobody looks sleepy, everybody look attentive now, but very good. How many bits we need to code size four? Four bits because we have six numbers. Very good. Actually, one bit to code size one, two bits to code size two, three bits to code size three, four bits to code size four. But the reason is because in size four, we have 16 values. Minus 15, minus 14, minus 13, minus 12, minus 11, minus uh, 10, minus 9, minus 8. Okay, and on the other side again the same. Good. Okay, so now we are going to use zigzag scanning. I already mentioned to you. Zigzag scanning, I would like you to learn zigzag scanning. It's very easy if you just go with your finger five times over it. The reason being is that at the exam questions you may have to zigzag scan something. It's a very simple principle, okay? But you start here. <coughs> Not here, you start here. You go down, a bit down like this, and reverse a bit to the right, like that, and so forth. And you continue zigzag scanning like this. <coughs> and what's going to happen? This is very interesting because I would like to show you this. This is very interesting. So we have a source image lab. And we have a block from LEN, so it's like from Bamboo. So we've taken a block. These are the image level values, pixel values. Then we perform a DCT transform. So when we transform that into DCT domain, we have now 64 coefficients. We can 
capacity. These are these coefficients here. They tell you how much of this, each of these basis functions you need to take to reconstruct them. There is something strikingly different between this and that. What do you observe here? What strikes you? What is the difference between that and that? What do you think is easier to code, this or that? Uh, the, the one at the bottom, yes. yes. And why? Uh, it's very small. Very small, yeah, very simple, very small. A lot of zeros, a lot of small values, right? Yeah. So when we transformed stuff from image domain into DC texture domain, we can see that there's a lot of small values, especially around here, around high frequency. That's because quite often there are not so many high frequencies in the image, okay? Very good, but then you forgot about one thing, that this was before we quantized, but we are still quantizing. What does it mean? We are rounding to the nearest value and the quantization step in all these things here was quite high. So now after quantization, this is the table we have. Is this difficult to code or easy to code? Very easy, even easier than the previous one, right? And why is that? It's a lot of zeros, right? Great. So, how are we going to code it? Well, first we have to say, we have to send the DC coefficients, you remember, you can show Then we are going to do zigzag scanning. Zigzag scanning it. Zero. Minus two, minus one, one, minus one, zero, zero, minus one. And after that, everything is zero. We can simply say, we can code up to this point, and usually a lot of things at the end will be zero, so we'll just simply say, that's it. It's no more values. End of block. There has to be some special symbol which is like, that's it. Forget about the rest. Fill up with zeros, right? That's why it's so efficient. We don't even have to say zero, 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 zero. Just say, stuff it, that's done. No more values, right? So that's why the zigzag scanning combined with this quantization gives you such a compact representation. You remember, initially, we had 64 values in the image, in the block. We could not just say, stuff it. We sent you... Uh, 20 pixel now, that's it. We are done, we are done. But here, actually, we said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten symbols, we are done. And they can still reconstruct the entire block, the entire image. Very good. So we have DC coefficient and we have zigzag scan coefficients. But please also notice that in zigzag scan coefficients, we also have a lot of zeros. <coughs> So somebody said, right. Because many of the coefficients are zeros, <clears throat> perhaps we should code jointly, jointly. So what we should say, we should say how many zeros we have. Because, okay, if we have everything as zero, so let me go here. Once I reach the end of the block, that's very easy, that's done. But be, even before, even here, please notice I have sequences like there is one zero followed by minus two, that there are no zeros followed by minus one, no zeros followed by minus one, no zeros. Here I have two zeros followed by minus one. So I could code pairs. I could say, I'm going to code this one here by saying how many zeros I have followed by what number. Okay. So if we do that, I have one zero followed by minus two, no zeros followed by minus one, no zeros one minus one, no zeros minus one, two zeros minus one. So I code it as a run length 
how many runs of zeros I have, followed by a number I have. And that was found to be extremely efficient. Okay? So, the way we code it is we say, how many zeros? One. And then the value after that we again code as a size and amplitude. You remember the size and amplitude coding of these coefficients we have? What is the size? It's small. And which of the small we have? We are going to apply this here as well. So I'll go back for a few seconds to show you the size. This one. Size range. And then we have another table which is size amplitude. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have three tricks here. The tricks are, or maybe four tricks, zigzag scan, DC coefficients are coded differentially, these coefficients are coded run length, value, and the value is coded as a size and amplitude. Okay? That's mm. all. That's the entire, entire JPEG. That's all the tricks. So, for example, if we look at a particular example, if we take a block and perform coding, this particular block that I've shown you here. This block, no, no, so this is the quantization. Uh, just a second. <coughs> this block from Lina, it's actual image. We went through compression. We performed DCT transform. This is the DCT transform. You can see we already reduced the stuff. Now we perform quantization, so we introduce some distortions, but they are not visible to humans, because we use, uh, we, we use special um, uh, quantization to apply to that. Then we did zigzag scan, we looked at the coefficients, then we apply um, the coding, zero length, run length, size, amplitude coding, and for each of these, we have a symbol, which is taken from lookup table in JPEG. And when we've done that, this block that you've seen is now represented by this string of bits. Looks pretty short, right? So what is the compression rate? The compression rate, originally, we have 8 pixels by 8 pixels times 8 bit per pixel, 256 value. So about 35 bits. Sorry, no, this is 8 times 8 times 8. This is uh, 64 times 8, which is? 64 times 8 is 5.54, right? 512 divided by, now we can calculate the number of bits here and it comes up at around 35. So we got a compression 15 to one, which is basically half a bit per pixel on average. How does it look? Looks good, I think, no? Half a bit per pixel, it's pretty good. And if we now inverse Inverse all these operations. This is the reconstructed block, original image block. Okay. So we can calculate block <coughs> distortions using RMS, mean uh, root mean square. You remember we're talking about PSNR root mean square, basically taking the differences, these are the reconstruction errors. This is the difference between the original block and what we had. 
and when we calculate, when we square all these differences and calculate the uh, root out of that, we'll get 2.26 pixels on average, RMS error, and PSNR 41 dBs. PSNR about 40 dBs is pretty good. You probably not see the distortions. So we achieve quite a high compression and and if you look at Lina, and if you look at um, the distribution of errors, it's kind of pretty randomly distributed. These are errors magnified. They are magnified by a factor of over 10, just to see them, otherwise you wouldn't see them. So this is a difference between what we had and what we achieved after compression, magnified. So you could say that depending on the, uh, uh, the bit rate that you apply per pixel, typical JPEG baseline algorithm, anything around sort of 0 0.5 bit per pixel is, is good quality, you can go down to 0 0.25 or even below that. And then the quality is not so good, you can, you can just get any JPEG implementation and play with it by sliding the quality factor. But we are firmly within sort of compression range. If you think about half a pixel per half a bit per pixel, what is the compression rate? In original image, how many bit per pixel? In original one, we have eight. But we go down from eight bit per pixel to half a bit per pixel. So what's the compression? Yeah, it's 16 times compressed, right? We need originally eight bit per pixel. Now we arrived with half a bit, so the compression is 16. Very good. I would like to let you now have a short break, five minutes, okay? Go outside, beautiful day. Enjoy the sunshine. Breathe in the fresh air, okay?